we'll start this uh, event now, if that's all right. First of all, a huge welcome on such a, a Greek day to have arrived here to come to the Jim McVicker, uh, McVicker Memorial Lecture, the annual event. To introduce myself, firstly, my name is uh, Richie Benton. I'm the Scottish Socialist Party's National Trade Union Organiser and uh, a friend and comrade of the late uh, Jim McVicker. Now, first of all, to explain that uh, this event we've turned into an annual one, we decided to honour and commemorate the life and struggle of a good friend and comrade Jim McVicker on an annual basis with a lecture. Uh, the first one I did, the second one Gordon Martin from the RMT did, and today we're very pleased and honoured to have Henry Bell, who will introduce properly in a few minutes. Today we're having an event to mark the life and times and struggle of Jim McVicker. Now some of you may not have known him, but let me briefly describe what the man was and therefore what he represents. He was a founding member of the SSP. For a long time, up until his death, he was our national treasurer. But of course his political history as a socialist preceded that. Jim uh, was born and grew up in the east end of Glasgow. He went on to work in the British Rail Engineering uh, plant, or at least he was employed there, as we often reminded him, and got paid. Uh, he went to work, allegedly, in that uh, place that was like a railway, railway repair yard just up the hill in uh, Springburn, and learned his trade unionism there and some of his socialism, as well as getting from his mother, who was a feisty uh, union convener, or as it was properly called, the mother of the chapel in the print union in Collins' uh, print shop, uh, bookshop. And Jim was given a copy of the Communist Manifesto by the shop steward the first day he went to work and told him to read it because the next time they met, as well as insisting that he had joined the union, no discussion, then we would be discussing the contents of Marx and Engels' famous uh, tract on behalf of scientific socialism. And he went on, of course, to be an activist later on. He was involved alongside his dearly beloved uh, partner of at least 50 years, Christine, who's here today once again, a comrade and friend of ours. Uh, Christine and Jim were heavily involved in the minor support group and activity during the great miner strike of, sad to say, 40 years ago. It dates us. He was involved in the struggle against the hated poll tax. He was involved in the campaign that we launched Hands Off Our Water in the early 90s to stop privatisation by the Tories of the water supply. <coughs> he was a socialist councillor for his native East End and fought the powers that be in the city chambers and in support of workers and communities. And like I said, was national treasurer of the SSB. He was a comrade who was also a friend, a dear friend, and very love and warm character, as well as being a terrible wind-up merchant. Uh, he uh, was, it, what summed him up for me was the fact that what turned out to be less than a week before he died, I was on the phone to him in his hospital bed, and he spent most of the conversation asking me how I was in the aftermath of a brutal six-month struggle after I was sacked by IKEA and fought against it and the stress involved. I had to turn the conversation into asking how he was, little knowing it would be the last one I would have with him. That was a measure of the man and his attitude as a human being. And let me put it this way, the past three years since Jim died in December 2020, he would just think of the, some of the events that he dearly missed and would dearly love to have been and proud to have been involved in alongside other SSP members. He would have been hugely impressed and encouraged by the upsurge of workers' struggles over the last 18 months and would have been there with us on the picket lines and really proud of the role the SSP did, uh, carried out in building solidarity for workers in struggle. He would have been proud of the way in which we tackled the powers that be, including that reprobate Michael Shanks of the Labour Party in the Rutherglen uh, by-election, calling them out for what they are. He would have been proud of the way in which the SSP has been quick off the mark to show solidarity with the people of Palestine against the genocidal assault 
for the Zionist Israeli uh, state and the way in which we advocated mass struggle and socialism in the Middle East to overcome the national divisions and the brutal war and conflict which was planted there in the first place by British and French imperialism and others in order to pursue their wealth in that oil rich uh, region. Jim would have been proud of all that. It would have been proud to see an assembly of people on a Sunday afternoon of this scale to discuss the ideas of John McLean and what they represent for 2024. Because he stood on the shoulders of people like McLean in terms of ideas. Summed up, for example, along with the rest of the SSP in our campaign, our crowning policy, if you like, of an independent socialist Scotland, as advocated in different language by McLean in the last couple of years of his life. Life is too short and therefore we have to make the most of it, both as human beings and as socialist activists to change the life that we're living. And that was the case with Jim, but even more so, brutally even more so, by the man who we're here to particularly talk about today, John McLean, the great Domini, the socialist educator, the Marxist educator, of working class people at classes of hundreds and sometimes thousands on street corners as well as in the Scottish Labour College and elsewhere. He was a man of course who died at the tragic age of 44 partly as a result of the privations and the punishments that he suffered at the hands of that callous class the capitalists of Britain including those of Scotland. And imagine for a minute what he <coughs> Uh, missed out on, even rapidly after his death <coughs> in November of 2023 on St Andrew's Day. He missed out on the fact that just a year and a half later the working class of Britain were involved in a generous strike, the nine days that shook uh, Britain that threatened the capitalist class with their rulership and could have potentially led to the possibility of a socialist to democracy. And of course, McLean, throughout his life, advocated against imperialism. And he quite rightly uh, made the point that capitalism breeds antagonism, leading to war. And the only way to avert war is to end capitalism. And I think that, in a sense, is what is at the heart of the stance that those of us who are socialists campaigning against war today, against imperialist war, including the Middle East, are involved in advocating and standing on the shoulders of that uh, giant. And I would add, and I know Henry will add, from his own writings that I've read, that the point has to be made that more so than in the days of <coughs> McLean even, that capitalism doesn't just threaten war, it threatens human extinction and that of many other species on the planet. Capitalism uh, is a society rampant in tooth and claw in its pursuit of profit at the cost to species, at the cost to the planet, as well as the cost to living standards. And I think it's very appropriate in introducing Henry that we have this event today, including here, because Town Head is the last area, last district of the city that McLean stood as a candidate in an election in the summer of 2023, just a few months before he died. And it's also an appropriate date. All this, of course, I carefully planned uh, because it's the 21st of January. It's the exact centenary of the death of Lenin, one of those giants of the international socialist movement who succeeded in building a party, the Bolsheviks, uh, as they became known at least one phase of their life, which succeeded in leading the peasants and workers of Russia in a successful socialist revolution. The same Lenin who, during his lifetime, made McLean the consul for the Bolshevik government in Scotland. So how did he hold uh, John McLean in his sights as a revolutionary, dedicated, clean-principled uh, socialist? And it's in the best traditions of McLean the educator that we hold events like this in order to help educate each other to be all the stronger in our ongoing socialist a struggle. And it's therefore in that context that today's theme is the life, the times 
and more to the point some of the principles of John McLean and how they relate to the 21st century. And as I said, we're particularly pleased to have uh, our guest lecturer, our guest speaker, Henry Bell, the author uh, and I think poet, but in particular the biographer of uh, John McLean. Uh, I think the most authoritative biography, and I'm not just blowing smoke up his proverbial. I uh, haven't read a few things about McLean. But I would highly recommend John McLean here of Red Clydeside as a good read on that subject, which Henry wrote, I think it was about five years ago. And therefore, what we'll have is a lecture from Henry on that subject. Well then, <coughs> after I cough all over you, and forgive me, post-Covid, uh, I'm infectious, just suffering the long aftermath six weeks later. But uh, we'll then uh, close that session, have a tea break, and then we'll have some live uh, music from my uh, two comrades who have kindly stepped into the breach when other artists uh, suddenly let me down at the last minute. So that's the plan. So therefore, give a good round of a warm applause, an introduction, and welcome to Henry Bell on the question of McLean. Thanks so much, Richie, for that, uh, that warm introduction, and thanks, comrades, uh, for being here. Um, I wanted to write something uh, new for the occasion, so you'll have to forgive me reading uh, from notes. I haven't got it off the pack yet, but, um, but I wanted to, to address particularly these questions of Maclean's life and how we might apply it to our current situation. Um, it's a great pleasure to be asked to give um, the Jim McVicker Memorial Lecture, um, and it's a great pleasure to do it here in Town Head. As, as Richie said, Town Head is the last place where Maclean stood for election. It's also a place that features uh, strongly in the forces that formed him and in his own life. Um, it's obviously here where, where John Knox came uh, with the thunder of Calvin back in the 16th century, it's here that the Covenanters were martyred, and that uh, that particular force of the Reformation had a deep influence on Maclean's life that I'll touch on a little in this talk. Um, but it's also here where Maclean returned in 1918 after his release from uh, hard labour in Peterhead Jail. Um, it's here that the Scottish Workers' Republican Party built its uh, earliest membership, and some of the longest standing work through the 1920s and, and around the general strike was done by that party here in Town Head. Um, and it's also here that uh, Maclean's comrades, uh, Guy Aldridge and Ethel MacDonald, had the Strickland Press and produced uh, a huge amount of socialist and anarchist literature uh, in the city throughout the 1930s. It's also, uh, as well as that often overlooked, radical history of Town Head, it's a place that's that's generally overlooked, existing as it does at the very edge of uh, the kind of palaces of commerce and industry that fill the city centre. It's a, it's a working class community of housing that has been demolished and rebuilt and demolished and rebuilt over the decades and centuries. Um, and in that, it's a place that throws into sharp relief that capitalist equation where as the money and wealth piles up in the hands of some, the misery and poverty piles up in the hands of others in the towers and tenements beyond the centre of the city. Um, it's also an honour to be giving uh, the Jim McVicker lecture because I think it's always very important for us to honour and remember our comrades and to think about their legacies and how we might continue their work and continue those legacies. Particularly at this moment as our country pursues its grim imperialist project in the Middle East, um, giving cover to genocide, I think that both McVicker and McLean would be pleased that we're having this meeting here in their names, I hope so at least. Um, and lastly, as Rich later on, I'm pleased that we're, we're here talking on this day, marking both the centenary of the passing of John McLean, but also, as it is today, the 100th anniversary since the death of Vladimir Lenin. Um, a man alongside McVicker and McLean who very much understood the near need for both theory and action. Um, and I think that's uh, another theme that I'd like to highlight through this, is how education and theory and ideas can be put into practice and how the connection and relationship between the two can work. As Lenin put it, sometimes history needs a push. Um, this is going to be a lecture about history, but I hope it's not an academic lecture. Um, I hope that we all understand that it's a history that is our history and a history that has a great bearing on our present and on our future. Um, I'm going to talk about the life and politics of the great revolutionary Marxist and educator John McLean. 
um, and how that work speaks to us in our present situation. John McLean died on St Andrew's Day 100 years ago in 1923. Lenin had called him the beloved leader of the Scottish workers, and MI5 uh, had called him the most dangerous man in Britain. Um, in his final years, he was at the heart of a movement of women, of unemployed people, and of immigrants in the city. Um, his final speeches focused on police brutality, on imperialism, on the growing threat that he already perceived in 1923 of fascists organising in his communities, um, and on the need for fair work and safe housing. Uh, I could never read those final papers that he issued for that election in Townhead without thinking how striking it is that our concerns a hundred years later remain. Police brutality, the fight for fair work and safe housing, the dangers of racism, imperialism and fascism. Um, Maclean taught Marxism to a generation and he made sure that socialism took root here in the west of Scotland as deeply as it did anywhere in these islands. Um, he stood resolutely with his class against capitalism, organising in solidarity with revolutions in Russia, Ireland and Germany, and campaigning for the breakup of the British Empire here, in Ireland, in Egypt and in India. Um, in the end, he gave everything for socialism, dying as he lived for a Scottish workers' republic sacrificing himself for the cause of a world free from war and exploitation. I'd like to talk about how Glasgow and how Scotland forged Maclean, how it developed his politics and how it led to his particular awakenings, and how the contrast between the wealth of the capitalists and the poverty of the workers was fundamental to his early life and fundamental to this city. Um, I'd like to focus on those political awakenings, the ways in which he worked, the ways in which he organised, his tactics, his ideas and his failures, and how we might look at his understanding of capitalism and imperialism uh, and apply it to today's continuing drive in Scotland, in Britain and in the West for genocidal war. Um, I'd like to talk about the price that Maclean paid for standing up to those wars, for standing up to the ruling class, uh, the brutality with which the ruling class disposed of him and also the deep effects that that had not just on him but on uh, his family, and particularly the women in his family. Um, I'd like to propose and discuss Maclean's mental health, a subject that comes up uh, in almost any writing about him, but is often touched on, I think, in different and unhelpful ways. And I'd like to think about perhaps a new paradigm for how we might think about Maclean's mental health. Um, and lastly, I want to think a little bit about how Maclean comes to us today, why he exists as a mythic figure, and what it means for him to be transformed from a comrade into an icon, and how we might uh, redress perhaps some of what's happened there. Um, I know obviously that this is uh, very much uh, an audience of the converted, um, and that many of the details that I'm going to discuss will be familiar to you, but I hope that uh, I'm going to draw out some uh, interesting points and situate McLean's life um, as a part of our living tradition, uh, as one comrade among many who we draw inspiration and power from. Um, so I'm going to start by talking a bit about Maclean's early life and how that influenced his politics and how it led to his trajectory within Red Clydeside. I often think about uh, the young Maclean at the turn of the last century reading Marx for the first time. Um, in his family's flat uh, on King Street in Pollock Shores, it's a two-room flat. One of the rooms let out um, to a lodger, the family in the other room. Um, his mother would have been out at work, his sisters would have been taking in laundry, and all of that work would have been so that Maclean could study, so that he could progress through his formal studies, but at the same time, he was encountering the radical socialism of the streets and teaching himself Marxism. Um, Maclean's father, a potter, had died young. Three of Maclean's siblings had died in infancy. The family had been cleared from the highlands and found themselves in poverty in the industrial suburbs of the city. Maclean said to his friend and Lieutenant McDougall later in life that it was at that point, in poverty in Pollock Shores with his sisters and his mother out to work, that he knew that he had to use his education for the raising up of the working class because they had sacrificed so much for him, he owed it to his own family. And his, in his studies, first at Queen's Park School, then at the Freekirk Training School, and finally at the University of Glasgow, um, where he studied economics and politics, but it was the economics and politics of the establishment. Um, but he also learned how to teach. Outside of that uh, economics of the establishment, Maclean encountered the radical ideas of revolutionary socialism. Um, as a teenager, he recalled reading Capital for the first time, and uh, in chapter 10, of Capital, there's a moment where Marx writes, 
The average duration of life in the pottery districts of Stoke-on-Trent and Wolstanton is extraordinarily short. Nearly two-fifths of all deaths are the result of pulmonary diseases among the potters. Dr. Boothroyd, a medical practitioner at Hanley, says each successive generation of potters is more dwarfed and less robust than the preceding one. And I think about how Maclean must have felt reading those words and knowing that his father, just six years before, had died of silicosis, which at the time was called Potter's Rot. Um, that his two brothers had also died from pulmonary diseases. This was Maclean encountering his own family life, his own father and brother's deaths, laid out in a clear, materialist understanding that these were not random tragedies, these were an intrinsic cost of capitalism. This was something that was being done to the Maclean family, a social murder, not a random event. In chapter 27 of Capital, Marx writes, The clearing made by the Duchess of Sutherland will suffice here. From 1814 to 1820, these 15,000 inhabitants, about 3,000 families, were systematically hunted and rooted out. All their villages were destroyed and burnt. All their fields turned into pasturage. British soldiers enforced this eviction. Again, it's Maclean's own family history. Uh, his family had been driven off the land. His mother and grandmother had walked 100 miles from Corpac to the Clyde Valley. They'd been forced out of their homes for reasons that Marx was here explaining in meticulous detail. This was the economic underpinning of Maclean's own life. This was why they were working class, why they were dying young, and why their life was a struggle. Maclean found in capital a clear explanation of his own material struggle, and a key to ending that struggle and building a better world. Marx named capitalism so that Maclean could see a way out of it. This moment, I think, is pivotal for Maclean because I think he understands here that the application of Marxism to the everyday lives of the people is an opportunity to transform the world. If he could describe the tragic global implications of capital with reference to the realities of the people around him lives, he knew that education could be key to their liberation, and that he only needed to give people a language with which to understand the oppression that they already felt inherently. Um, Sylvia Pankhurst gives us a description of Maclean in this early uh, period as an educator, where she says, Thick-set and swarthy as a Neapolitan, he recalled to me irresistibly the thought of a great brown bear. His small eyes dark and twinkling, his mouth, as he talked, with his entire set of white teeth, like a dog, at times playfully opening it in a game and shutting it, drawing his lips back in a snarl. Both expressions were common to him. I've heard him in his hoarse voice with delighted smiles, expounding to his class on Marxian economics the parable of the three coats, as though the very hearing of it were the universal cure the wine of life. He caused young wet men and women to read and think for themselves. Um, Maclean didn't just believe that Marxism could be liberatory, he felt in himself that it was liberatory, that it had changed his life and that it had changed his family's life, and he wanted the working class to understand their relation to power. Um, in the year that followed Maclean's Damascene conversion to socialism, he taught classes on Marxist economics to tens of thousands of workers on Clydeside, in the Fife Coalfields, in the Welsh Valleys and beyond. Was that the project of his life was touring the whole of the British Isles and Ireland and teaching Marxism. Um, and that was his great contribution to the struggle, and I think, curiously, we often overlook that. Um, Maclean obviously stood against the war, he made his famous speech from the dock, um, he stood against empire, he endured hard labour in the capitalist jails. Um, those are the things that make him an icon, perhaps, but the thing that made him a revolutionary was his steadfast dedication to Marxist education and the fact that he pursued that for his whole life without relent. Um, I think it's an extraordinary thing for our movement to have a figurehead uh, who is an educator, whose revolutionary message is not um, on the barricades or the picket lines, as important as the barricades and picket lines are, but is in rooms like these where people talk to each other and come to understand their own lives and their own existence. Um, and I think there's a crucial lesson in that today. I've been uh, part of the revolutionary left my whole life, um, and my whole life I've been on marches and occupations and at picket lines, but it was only in 2020, during lockdown, um, where I had the, the space to finally read Capital, and with a small group of comrades, um, we did that over the lockdown online, and, uh, and it was life-changing. I can honestly say it was life-changing. Not because the ideas were new, I've obviously heard them at meetings many, many times, but it was because the precision and the logic and the method of those books transformed how I thought about my own life, how I thought about my own work and my family. 
Um, and I think we often neglect that message of McLean's, that, that truly education can liberate us. Um, in the 25 years from McLean first reading Capital uh, as a young man in that flat, um, Clydeside was transformed. In 1900 it was known as a liberal city. Of all of the industrial centres uh, in the British Isles, it had the lowest trade union membership. It elected Liberal and Tory members of Parliament. Um, the socialist movement was uh, so small in Edwardian times that there's a bit in Maclean's diaries where he, uh, in Maclean's letters, where he's writing to a comrade about how great the Socialist Democratic Federation's meeting had been in, in the town because nearly 20 people had attended the meeting. Um, I find that a really powerful and hopeful thing to remember because within a decade of Maclean writing that letter. Clydeside has transformed into a city of the world revolution, a city in which hundreds of thousands of people uh, attend meetings. And the fact that ideas uh, can transform a city and a people that quickly is something that I think should be a great source of inspiration to us today. A um, hundred years on, Glasgow remains a city firmly associated with the working class movement and uh, I think well known as the city in which socialism uh, is most firmly established. And I think. Many factors contributed to that, but undeniably one of them, uh, one, uh, foremost one among them, was Maclean's commitment to radical education. Um, leading figures of Red Clydeside, such as Crawford, Gallagher, Brooksbank, Dolan, Maxton, McShane, all came through Maclean's Marxist classes. He provided uh, an engine for those people to go out and spread and enact and teach Marxism to more people. Um, on the 50th anniversary of Maclean's death, there was an article in the Times in 1973, and uh, in it, the, the writer, who's not necessarily sympathetic to Maclean, says that you can't visit uh, a coalfield in Scotland or in the north of England without an old man telling you that he learned Marxism from John Maclean. That's how far the reach was. Now, there's an element like the Sex Pistols of the 100 Club, where a lot of people wanted to say they learned Marxism from John Maclean. But nevertheless, it remains true that the reach that he had in his life truly was transformative, and the energy that he put in had its effect in the radical transformation of Clydeside uh, into a socialist and communist city. Um, Maclean's commitment to democracy and education, to the working class raising itself up, comes in part, I think, from the type of Scotland in which he was born. Um, I think it's interesting to reflect on his peers, the great revolutionaries of the early 20th century, uh, Lenin, Trotsky, Gramsci, Liebknecht, Luxembourg, um, all came from uh, middle or upper class backgrounds. All of them um, resolutely gave their lives to the working class, but were not of the working class. Um, whereas in Scotland, the two towering revolutionary figures of that period, James Connolly and John Maclean, uh, absolutely come from the working class and absolutely no poverty. Uh, and I think it bears reflecting on why Scotland was able to produce, uh, or rather produce, give opportunity to these two working class intellects. Uh, and I think in some part that's to do with, again, a commitment to education, to do with the fact that there was accessibility to education, however slight it was for the working class, it existed in a way that it didn't in Ukraine or Poland where uh, the working class equivalents of Trotsky and Luxembourg would not have been able to attain the education that Maclean did. Um, and I think one of the reasons for that, ironically, and it brings me back to the history of this part of the city, uh, is the extremity of the Calvinist Reformation and the, the seeds of Calvinism, however mixed they may be, planted seeds both for the harshness and earliness of the Industrial Revolution here in central Scotland, but also for a radical and liberatory commitment to democracy and education. It's a, it's a dialectic uh, aspect, a kind of Calvinist Marxist that he was. Um, I often think of him saying that the, in 1917, the mantle of Christ descended on the Bolsheviks. And, and for him, he very much experienced a trajectory where Christ had an idea but failed, and that our movement was able to take that idea forwards. Um, as well as being committed to educating others, Maclean was committed to his own studies, and every day he walked the five miles from Pollock Shores to Gilmore Hill where he studied at the university. Um, I'd like us to trace this journey a bit uh, as a way to understand Maclean, to understand the milieu that Maclean was coming from, but also 
to uh, explore aspects of Glasgow as they existed 100 years ago and to think about how they maybe exist today. So as he left his home uh, on King Street, which is now uh, Shawbridge Road, he passed what's now the demolished uh, Shawbridge Arcade and the John McLean Fair, and he'd immediately hit the wall of, uh, of the grounds of Pollock House. Um, which was still the private gardens of the Sterling Maxwell family's estate. He'd follow that wall, and I think the contrast between the unbelievable opulence of Pollock House and those gardens, I don't know if you've been to Pollock House, and there's a photo by the cafe of the staff party, it's a staff Christmas too. There's some 300 people that were working for the, the Sterling Maxwell family at that time. Um, unimaginable to the tenement dwellers just on the other side of that wall where McLean lived. Um, the Sterling Maxwells owned most of what is now Pollock, Pollock Shores, Crossmaloof, Dunbreck and Pollock Fields and by the 1900s they were turning those areas of farmland and coal mining land uh, into housing. But their, their wealth didn't come from property and it didn't come from the exploitation of the Scottish working class. The Sterling Maxwell's fortune was made in the West Indian Mercantile Company, which profited from slave plantations throughout the 18th century. The Maxwells contained fork controlled four major plantations in Jamaica where hundreds of enslaved people were forced to work for them. Uh, four members of the Sterling Maxwell family are named recipients in the, at the abolition of slavery when uh, compensation is paid by the British government to slavers. And they get £22,000 for the emancipation of 1,343 people that they enslaved. That's more than £3 million in today's money. Um, the family also had plantations in Virginia for which no records survive. And a final note on them that I think is interesting, uh, they, they, they mostly trade as the Earls of Nithsdale now, but they still occasionally use their title as Barons of Nova Scotia. Um, and this was a Scottish peerage which was created for them for money. They paid the Scottish King to become Barons of Nova Scotia, and the money was used to fund the Scottish colonisation of Nova Scotia, um, a colonisation that is now recognised as a genocide. Um, the Acadian people of Nova Scotia were entirely displaced, and worse than that, Scottish settlers in Nova Scotia were paid for the scalp of each Micmac person that they returned uh, to the town. Um, and the Maxwells still keep apartments in Pollock House and still use their Nova Scotian title. Uh, that might all seem like a slight digression, but I think it's an important thing to understand how intertwined empire and the suffering of colonial subjects was to the suffering of working class people in Pollock Shores, because the people directly oppressing them were the same people. Um, as McLean left the edge of the Maxwell's estate, he'd walk through the villas and well-appointed uh, tenements of Shawlands and Strathbunga, which is where McLean uh, taught at his first school. Um, he was fired from that post for refusing to teach the Bible as truth, uh, for campaigning against homework. Um, <laughs> McLean would then walk through the slums at the southern edge of the Clyde, um, the Gorbals, Kingston, Tradeston, Kenning Park, Govan. And these were places where poverty and disease and infant mortality was as high as it was anywhere in Europe. Um, the last outbreak of the bubonic plague was in the Gorbals in 1904, during this period. Um, and on these streets, Maclean would hear Yiddish, Russian, Gallic, Irish, Chinese, Arabic, Hindi spoken by the workers and the sailors. Um, this was a vast global dispossessed, uh, who like Maclean's own family were forced into the city against their will, cut off from the land. Um, Again, it's this internationalism of capital that allows for the internationalism in Maclean's outlook. Uh, I think often uh, a lie is told about Glasgow that it's, it's in some way uh, a provincial or parochial or white city, and that's never been true because it's a city that's forged both by capital and by labour. Both of those things are hugely international, and they were for Maclean. Um, on the Clyde itself, Maclean would pass the factories and yards and cranes, uh, the kind of foremost centre of heavy industry of the world's first capitalist superpower. Um, and even then, it, it would have been obvious that the growing arms race between Britain and Germany was leading to a proliferation of work on the Clyde, of the building of battleships and of the building up of armies. Um, but as he left the deafening noise of the furnaces and riveters and trains and ships, uh, he'd enter into another world as he crossed the river, because here were department stores and theatres, tea rooms, restaurants, orchestras, private banquet halls, private members clubs, um, and the throng of elaborate villas and mansions that stretch from the west of the city centre out towards Gilmore Hill where he was studying at the university. Um, 
Beneath that university was the Kelvin Grove Park, where you know liberal and progressive uh, life could be demonstrated by taking tea in the Macintosh tea rooms and going to visit the African, Arctic, or Highland villages where a human zoo was held, and people could see uh, people from Equatorial Guinea, from Lapland, and from the Scotch Highlands performing their folk rituals. Um, again, this. Uh, proliferation of wealth and progress demonstrating the misery that comes in its wake at every turn. Um, Maclean took his classes on political economy at Glasgow University there above Kelvin Grove Park and uh, it's, you know, we're, we're at a point where it seems sometimes that there's not more to learn about Maclean but a, a researcher at Glasgow University just turned up the fact that um, it was actually the Carnegie Trust that paid for Maclean's studies uh, at Glasgow University so there's a kind of Beautiful irony in Scotland's most famous industrialist, Andrew Carnegie, paying for the studies of its most famous revolution. Um, Maclean studied hard at Glasgow University, and, and for all uh, that he condemned the establishment and he condemned the system, he took his studies very seriously and he was extremely proud of his MA, something that's quite remarkable that uh, you know, the, the son of uh, two refugees from the Highlands was able to achieve at that time. And he came second in his year, um, but he always viewed the study of political economy there as the study of his enemy. Uh, and he devoted himself instead to Marxism and to Marxist texts. Um, I've taken us alongside Maclean on that walk there um, to highlight the material conditions of his own development, his own connection to class and internationalism, but also to look at the deeply uh, entwined nature of capitalism, colonialism, racism and war. Um, I think it would be uh, fruitful for all of us to reflect on our own experiences in this same city, a city where villas in the West End and the South Side still house people on million pound salaries who enjoy lives of luxury, and where on the other side of those walls uh, people still live uh, in poverty and hunger. Um, it's a city of thousands of damp flats, of people that can't afford heating. Uh, it's a city where uh, increasingly young immigrant men share rooms and share IDs and cycle across the city delivering Korean food to people that hardly think about the people that are bringing them their dinner. Um, it's a city where hundreds of refugees are homeless through this winter and a city where machines made in Govan continue to rain hell down on Gaza. Um, in the 21st century the distances are far greater than they were for Maclean. Our immediate oppressors don't live at the end of our streets anymore. The factories, those that remain, are headed by faceless boards and bosses hundreds and thousands of miles away. We can't march to their doors as people did in the days of Maclean, but the logic of accumulation of one global class that profits through the dispossession of another remains unchanged. And the forces that drove Maclean's family out of the highlands, that drove his comrades out of Russia and out of Ireland remain exactly the same. The web of capital continues to control our lives. Um, I'm going to move on a little to, to that political awakening and that encounter with Marxism now. Maclean, from his life, was, uh, was on a mission to ensure that uh, no one person could have power over another. Before even he found Marxism, he felt this strong uh, desire that no one should be able to lessen another person. That's central to his own interpretation of Marxism, I think. He wrote in 1902, uh, aged just 21, to make wealth rapidly, capitalists have wrought men and women and children long hours at high speed and for wages that just keep them alive. Here the class struggle begins with the desire to steal the maximum from the workers. The workers feel the necessity of united effort so that they may resist the attacks of the enemy, the capitalist. Trade unions are formed and the strike is used to get as much of the wealth produced as possible. But wives and children starve and the unions must yield. Though united, the workers still fight an unequal battle. That the class struggle is bitter, we need only reckon the annual death toll of the workers, the maimed, the poisoned, the physically wrecked by overwork, the mentally wrecked by worry, and those forced to suicide by desperation. It is a more bloody and more disastrous warfare than that to which the soldier is used. Living in slums, breathing poisonous and carbon-laden air, wearing shoddy clothes, eating adulterated and life-extinguishing food, the workers have greater cause for forcible revolution that had the French capitalists in 1789. Um, it's clear that this young man's understanding of the class struggle is, is unambiguously Marxist here. He sees a class warfare that's laid out as a historical process, um, that one class must overcome another, just as the French Revolution had done a century before. Um, 
And McLean was an orthodox Marxist, yeah? he believed in scientific socialism, um, a, a clear and literal understanding that economic forces shape our world. Um, but he wasn't inflexible and he wasn't sectarian. McCain's politics grew from each struggle that he encountered. Um, and throughout his life, he didn't just uh, try to teach comrades, he tried always to learn from comrades. His initial political route was purely electoral. As a member of the Social Democratic Federation, he was part of a, a Marxist political party that believed that universal suffrage and the ballot box, after the model of the German SDP, um, was the best path towards uh, worker control. But the early experiences that Maclean had in the Dockers' strike in Belfast and in the great unrest here in Scotland um, made him see that, that strikes weren't some sectional concern for some workers against other workers or for some workers against their bosses. They were in fact a political school in which workers could come to understand their own collective power and the fact that they could rely on each other. Um, Maclean's organising work at the Singer Strike uh, and with the women at the Neilston Mill in particular um, gave him a firm belief in the power of workplace organising and also in what syndicalism had to offer to the movement. Uh, his politics were transformed again by the street meetings that he held. Um, here in Glasgow and across Scotland he was surrounded at these meetings not just or not even chiefly by the workers of the factories and shipyards but by the unemployed and by the homeless and um, by what uh, the Social Democratic Federation dismissed as a class that would come along with them rather than a class that would lead them. And Maclean saw something different and he began to organise uh, actions such as the symbolic occupation of the Glasgow Stock Exchange, uh, the occupation of the city chambers just down the hill. Uh, and these really prefigure a radical street politics of the 1920s, uh, the hunger marches and the organising of unemployed people by the Communist Party. Um, and again, they put him at odds with the kind of slow reformism and the respectable politics of the Second International that was his milieu. Um, Prince Kropotkin wrote at that time that the Marxist parties of Western Europe felt that the, the once respected occupation of revolutionary was now a useless relic, a kind of buffoonery or provocation. Uh, Maclean's disillusionment uh, with reformist politics of the Second International continued to grow throughout the years leading to the war, and in that time, uh, international connections such as Jim Larkin, uh, Peter Petrov, Irma Gelrich, um, brought him into contact with the ideas of Lenin and Luxembourg and Connolly. These were already emerging as figures who saw a need to move beyond uh, the labour movement and to build something different to what the Second International was doing. Uh, all of that made Maclean ripe for the paroxysm of the First World War. Um, many of his comrades fell in line with the war effort. The SDF uh, ordered its organisers here in Glasgow to recruit for the war and to go and enlist people. Um, all of the meetings in theatres in the city were cancelled out of respect. The ILP even ceased their meetings at the start of the war. Um, Maclean moved in the opposite direction and he became at this point <coughs> a revolutionary rather than a constitutional Marxist. Um, his political party's instructions to support the war effort he rejected and he built his own cadre here in Glasgow resisting that. Um, and I think that's because his deep understanding of Marxism allowed him very easily to comprehend the forces at play in this new imperialist war. Um, he saw clearly that the internal contradiction of capital that he taught every night in his classes, um, the fundamental fact that the capitalists must drive down wages whilst producing ever more commodities and selling them to the very proletariat they exploited, meant that those capitalists had to find markets beyond their own country. And if they had to find markets beyond their own country, they had to have empires and they had to keep armies. Um, both for the pillaging of raw materials, but also for the holding of captive markets to flood those commodities into. So if capitalism required imperialism and imperialism required war, then in the evidence of the First World War, Maclean had the clearest example yet through which to explain Marxism to the people of Glasgow, who now were not only being literally exploited by the bosses, but were also being sent off to die in the trenches. Um, like Lenin, Maclean believed that the First World War needed to be transformed into a class war, into a civil war. Um, and he said about that at once, believing that organising here in Glasgow was the best way to end the war. <coughs> Um, again, I think there's points of inspiration we should take from this. I think that Maclean's ability to transform his politics, to absorb ideas from anarchists, from syndicalists, from Christian socialists, from Bolshevists, um, relied on his solid grasp of Marxism. 
Um, that gave him the gift not of being uh, a doctrinaire or a steadfast thinker, but of being a flexible thinker who had a system for absorbing and synthesizing new ideas. Um, and I think we often encounter, uh, both in political parties but also in ourselves, uh, ideas that are too fragile to be flexible. Um, and I think McLean is a great lesson in rejecting that kind of thinking uh, and applying a radical method to what we encounter in the world. Um, he was also suspect of anyone that quoted Marx in a thus spake Marx kind of way. Uh, he believed that, that Marx was no prophet, he was someone who presented his ideas. And I think we should do the same with McLean. I don't think that there's uh, a great deal to be gained by uh, holding up McLean as some kind of prophet or his writings as some kind of scripture. Um, but I think that we can look at his political and tactical decisions and try and apply them to our own lives. Um, as has already come up uh, from Richie and myself, the minds of many of us in this room will be on Palestine. Um, and I think it bears thinking about how McLean's legacy should impact those of us organizing in solidarity with Palestine and campaigning against Israel's genocidal war. Um, and I, for me, the key to that is to return to economics. I think too often the positions of Israel are presented as religious or historic or civilizational conflicts. Um, and in that way, the material realities of Israel are obscured to us. And by obscuring that reality, we obscure the solutions to that oppression. Um, or we make the solutions seem distant. Um, but they are. They're, they're immediate and, and once you unpack the forces behind them, they're uh, deceptively simple. Um, there's a trail of money that leads from the now nigh on uninhabitable homes of Gaza directly to the factories here and through them directly to the stock exchanges in London and New York. And the violence that Israel has subjected Palestinians to for 75 years is a colonial violence that's condoned and supported by our countries for profit. Israel isn't propped up by guilt and it's not propped up by ideology, it's propped up by money. Um, the mechanisms of the occupation itself are economic. Uh, the sudden collapse of Israeli manufacturing and construction shows us that, that as uh, Israel loses access to the cheap captive labour in its economy. It holds those open air prisons deliberately to hold a cheap labour reserve in its country. Um, it's also obvious in the oil prospecting that's already going on off the coast of Gaza, and I'm sure we'll see soon Israel beginning to try and extract that wealth from Palestinian waters. Um, we can also follow the economics of international solidarity. Why are America and Britain defending Israel? And why are they bombing Yemen? And why do we find ourselves embroiled again in another imperial war in the Middle East? Um, a war that uh, almost hysterically is called Operation Prosperity Guardian, uh, Operation Money War. They're not even bothering to lie to us there. Um, I think we should also think about the economics of why a two-state solution is so repeatedly uh, in our media presented as the, the obvious and liberal solution to the suffering in the Middle East. Um, Palestinian Marxists today, as Palestinian Marxists always have, reject a two-state solution uh, as a racist solution that allows the continued economic subjugation of one people by another, even after the occupation ends. Um, if we look at Israel and Palestine through an economic lens, we can see clearly that war and division and racism are symptoms of capitalist domination. I think we can also look further back than that as well. I remember going to a talk by um, the late great Marxist Neil Davidson about the Jewish population here in Glasgow in McLean's time and why so much of uh, the membership of Red Clydeside parties was drawn from that community. Um, and he talked about how that Jewish community, particularly in the Gorbals, had fled for their lives from uh, the Russian Empire, but had come here and had encountered the same prejudices. They found themselves excluded from work, they found themselves unable to rent houses in other parts of the city. And they, uh, as a community, had met two responses to that. And one was to commit themselves to socialism and see that the anti-Semitism that was rife was an expression of the divisions of capitalism, that it existed specifically to turn worker against worker. And the other was Zionism, which said, we can't remedy the society, we need to go and build somewhere else for ourselves where we're safe. And that battle between Zionist and, and Bundist socialist forces within that Jewish community is one in which I think our movement failed. We failed to put across the answer to Jewish uh, comrades in Europe that, that they could be safe 
And Zionism, therefore, is a kind of outsourcing of anti-Semitism here to the Middle East. When we talk about there being anti-Semitism uh, among Palestinians in the, in the Middle East, that's something that has been forced upon them because anti-Semitism as an evil of capitalism was not resolved here in Europe. Um, a further purpose of this economic analysis of our nation's wars is to draw the direct lines from those wars to the people that are responsible here and to see the incredible interconnectedness of finance and the military and to lay the blame here at the feet of Scottish capitalists. Uh, and make no mistake, Maclean was at war with Scottish capitalists. I think it's also all too easy to blame the British state or to blame British capitalism, but it's always been Scottish capitalism that has been complicit in these imperial violences. Um, and I'd like to mention briefly the Thales Three, who were convicted in December uh, of uh, trespass and sabotage at the Thales plant in Govan, a, a site where Maclean organised at the factory gates and which now produces the optic parts of the drones that uh, are used in Gaza, uh, the Reaper drones. And those, those three comrades will be sentenced this week at the Sheriff Court. And I think we should go down and show our solidarity and gratitude to them. Um, McLean never shied away from asking a great deal of the workers. Uh, he never underestimated what the workers could offer and that they could act in solidarity even if it was against their own interests, particularly in the case of shipyard workers and munition workers. Um, and I think that remains true today. Scotland has a, a deep militaristic history, but it also has a deep history of anti-militarism. And I think if we look at the, the Clyde Workers Committee and their work, we look at things like the Rolls-Royce Workers' Solidarity with Chile, and we think about how <clears throat> A BAE and Thales, we could ask fellow workers in those factories to show that solidarity again today with the people of Palestine. <clears throat> um, a third and final uh, economic lesson from that that I'd like to touch upon is that Maclean's understanding of capital crisis and imperialism meant, as Richie put it, that he understood that capitalism inherently brought with it in its storm clouds the trail of war. And I think we know, as Richard said today, that capitalism brings with it death for everyone. It is a death cult. It's, a, it's a, an absolute truism that you are either against capitalism or you are for the end of the world. Uh, and I think we need to be communicating that message louder than ever because I think that many, many young people feel that deep climate anxiety and that deep understanding that we are part of a society that is destroying the planet. But like workers in McLean's time, they don't necessarily have the language and structural analysis with which to piece together how and why the planet is being destroyed. And I think Marxism uh, in McLean's classes offered that to workers in their fight against the war, and I think we can offer it today to people struggling uh, against fossil fuel industries uh, and the factories at Grangemouth and in Clydebank. And McLean paid a brutal price for this stand he took against the war. The state made his life unlivable, they took away his freedom, they took away his health. When I was writing uh, this biography, one of the most kind of poignant moments for me was when I first went into the records office in Edinburgh and I asked for the Maclean papers. It's, it's the place on Princes Street where they keep all the government and police records. Uh, and this huge trolley came up with stacks and stacks and stacks because every meeting he held, everywhere he went from 1915, until the end of his life, there were shorthand police reporters and spies, both from the military, from Strathclyde police, and from the secret police, following him. And I think the impact of that on him cannot be underestimated. Um, um, but in that war on the plane, those rulers created many more victims. Um, Nan and Jean, his daughters, suffered hugely through his imprisonment. Um, and they eventually lost their father. Anne McLean, John's mother, wrote that she lived in terror for the whole of her life, that McLean was going to be arrested or hanged. Um, and Agnes, John's wife, devoted herself both to her husband and to the revolution, um, and she was repaid with penury and cruelty, um, though she reunited with McLean in the final months of his life. Following McLean's time in jail, both the British establishment and the Communist Party began to promulgate the idea that he'd lost his mind. Um, this was in part to discount his positions on Scottish independence and in part to explain away why he wouldn't join the Communist Party from the point of the Communist Party. From the British establishment, it was to try and undermine one of the greatest organisers in the country. Um, 
I, I mention it because I think uh, anyone that's read McLean's writing uh, before prison, during prison, and after prison uh, would, would be lying if they said that his analysis and his wit and his critical faculties are in any way diminished towards the end of his life. It's in those final years of his life that he puts together a uh, concept of imperialism where he finally comes to understand the point of the Easter Rising and the meaning of Connolly's work in Ireland and to extend it to what can be done here in Scotland. Um, but I also think anyone that reads those writings and doesn't see that particularly in the letters from prison, um, we're dealing with a man who has become paranoid and obsessive. Um, and I think there's little doubt that McLean did experience a breakdown uh, in Peterhead. But I'm not saying that to echo slanders of the likes of Willie Gallagher and Manny Shinwell, um, because I, I think that too often this is viewed as some kind of mark against him or a way to disregard his writing or later organising work, and I couldn't be further from making that point. Um, I don't think that his mental health should ever be weaponised against him. I want to think about that madness in a different way. There are these key questions. Did he have a psychotic break? Was he unstable afterwards? Were his positions on independence and the Communist Party affected by ill health? And were the accusations against him simply slanders set to destroy him? And I think those are interesting things to discuss, but I would prefer to look at the accusations of madness against McLean in a way that I think is less dated and more relevant to where we are today. We know undoubtedly that McLean suffered huge physical and mental suffering at the hands of the police and the prison system. Um, we know that much of his paranoia and his overvalued ideas of being followed, of being betrayed, of being poisoned were actually rooted in, in truth and in real facts of how he was persecuted by the state. Um, and I think hopefully we've reached a stage where we can synthesise our understanding of McLean's mental suffering into our image of the man without lessening him in any way. Um, I think we should be standing in compassion and solidarity with a comrade who suffered greatly in jail. Um, and who was traumatised by those experiences, but also drew lessons from those experiences and came out strengthened in his commitment to the revolution. Um, in thinking about that, I'm also uh, kind of conscious of that other Glaswegian radical R.D. Lane and how he described uh, the link between breakdowns and breakthroughs. Uh, and I think there's something in that of how we look at McLean. Um, I'm going to round up with a, a sort of bit of time thinking about the myth, uh, legend and legacy of McLean, how he comes to us today as this kind of mythic figure, this icon of, of Red Clydeside, almost the kind of like talismanic presence in the movement. Um, McLean and his comrades unleashed an energy that helped generations of people in Scotland to understand their class interests and to periodically shake the bastions of political and economic power. Um, as a symbol, he was present at and inspired decades of radical action from the rent strikes and pre peace crusades of 1915 to the international brigadiers of the 1930s, the unemployed movements of the 1920s, the Legions, Upper Clyde shipbuilder workings of the 70s and 80s, the Glasgow girls of the early 2000s, and the surrounding of the deportation ban on Tenure Street a few years ago. Um, these movements gain in their strength and self knowledge through the legend of Maclean and through the legend of Red Clydeside, and it plays an active part in the city. Um, his life and work inspired countless thousands of socialists and communists. He's become a kind of secular patron saint, uh, both for the Scottish Socialist movement, but also for the literary renaissance, for the folk revival, uh, and for ideas of Scottishness itself. Um, his daughter, Nan Milton, wrote that he forged the Scottish link in the golden chain of world socialism. Um, and people like Hamish Henderson, Hugh McDermott, Matt McGinn, Mary Brooksbank, took up that message, that idea of Maclean representing a Scottish internationalism and a Scottish identity within a world brotherhood uh, and built the folk revival, the literary renaissance, the people's festival, many of the things that we come to associate with what Scotland is along a Maclean line. Um, his daughter, Nan Milton, added that she thought that it was the poetry and the song that contained the true heart of Maclean. And I think that's interesting because I think uh, in this hundredth year, although there have been many events from Maclean, it's obvious that he lacks any organisation or institutional home in the left. It's hard for any party to claim him. You know, he stood for the Labour Party, but he also despised the Labour Party. You know, he famously <laughs> said that uh, Karl Marx died in 1883, but has been murdered every year since by the British Labour Party. Um, which is sadly truer this year than ever before. Um, you know, he, he was 
foundational in the movement that led to the Communist Party being built. They refused to join the Communist Party and accept that they would be run from London. Um, he's obviously adopted by the national movement, but he disdained nationalism and, and in uh, he was invited to speak at the commemorations for the Treaty of Arbroath up in Arbroath and he went up there specifically to mock a nationalism that had Scottish soldiers over suppressing the rising in Ireland. Um, but it's poets and songwriters uh, and the people that are able to take on Maclean's message and his legacy much more than any party or any institution and I think that gives a value to him. I think, you know, it speaks to his commitment to ideas and to his thrownness, but it also allows him to be a figure that can be individually claimed and moved within the left. Um, he's also a figure that's, that's truly popular in that he's of the people and truly tragic, as in he, he was a, a man with flaws and a man who was unable in the end to uh, give up. Uh, certain elements of the cause when his wife and his family asked him to, when, when Agnes said, you will die if you continue doing this. And he rejected that, uh, and he did indeed collapse on stage uh, at Cinema in Oatlands, and died at home a few days afterwards. And I think that's also worth reflecting on it. Like, I was thinking, <coughs> in writing this book, about what is the point of Marxist biography? Like, what are we, what are we trying to achieve by writing the life of one person? Um, and I think in part it's because it's interesting to think, uh, as we do about Jim McVicker, about the lives of socialists, the lives of comrades. What does it mean to live comradely lives and how uh, are we best to do that? And I think there are great lessons from Maclean about how to do that, but I think there are also um, mistakes that we should reflect upon in Maclean's life as well. Um, and in that way I think the myth of Maclean can be obscuring. I think that we lose sight of the man. Uh, McLean. We lose sight of his subtlety and his humanity and his wit and also his thrownness. Um, McLean's relation to nationalism is also a part of that myth um, and at times that's been foregrounded and I perhaps haven't touched on it very much in this lecture and I, and I don't really intend to but um, it's interesting though I think to note that it was a politically disastrous decision at the time for McLean uh, to come out of the Russian independence. It divided him from the mass uh, of the workers around him. And he, although he built a party, the Scottish Workers Republican Party, that was a foundational Scottish Republican movement, it didn't achieve a mass membership, and after his death it failed to build on what he'd achieved. Um, but that isn't to say that Maclean's position on Scottish independence was wrong, or that it was an error. Um, it gave him a constituency out with Marxism to speak to, and it also presaged the key anti-imperialist battleground of the 20th century, which was the application of socialism to national liberation. Um, Maclean remains well remembered and mythologized by nationalists, but he was never a nationalist, and I don't think we should allow him to be claimed as one. Marxism was his guiding model for understanding the world, um, a model that allowed him to critically examine facts and come up with an economic and moral basis for action. Um, he saw Scottish independence as a tactic that could be used instrumentally. Uh, you know, I, I'm reminded of those posters in 2014 that said, <coughs> the workers have no country, but Scotland's a good place to start. Uh, and I think that very much chimes, for me, with Maclean's legacy and, and the position that I take in line with him. Um, he didn't experience some kind of, you know, massive conversion from being the phlegmatic home ruler that he was in early life to the committed Republican that he was at the end of his life. Instead, he was an engaged political thinker that witnessed the struggle in Ireland and witnessed other anti-imperialist struggles and drew lessons for them that continue to be applied here in Scotland today. Um, I also think that though he was isolated at the end, though he uh, didn't manage to build the Republican movement here that he dreamed of, uh, we shouldn't count that against him and we should understand the interconnection of anti-capitalism and anti-imperialism that he laid the foundations for though defeated in his lifetime, remain a key battleground for us today. Um, and it's our defeats and sacrifices that give meaning to our movement. Um, Maclean's death is a sort of foundational myth for our movement. And as Rosa Luxemburg said, our defeats are vital to us. We need every one of them because each one is a step in the right direction. Um, Maclean is vital as a myth to me. Um, we need stories to help us to live imaginatively in this city and in this movement. 
Um, and McLean, more than anyone, provides that, I think. Um, he's a window <coughs> to the future and a glimpse of a better Glasgow, a better Scotland, and a better world in which the things of that world are held in common by us. Um, but at the same time, I hope that I've uh, helped us to engage with McLean the man as well, as a human, as a husband, as a thinker, and as a comrade. Um, by remembering McLean as a man who lived in this city and fought for the total reconstruction of society, the same reconstruction that we're fighting for today, I think we can best embody his life he did, and to live up to his rallying call, we are out for life and all that life can give us. Um, I'd like to finish by uh, reading a poem that, uh, that I'm fond of by Alan Bold that touches upon the radical history of Scotland uh, and how it has been used and misused and how we have a chance to do something different with Maclean. It's called Words for John Maclean by Alan Bold. Scotland seems to happen in the past tense. There is a swell of pride, a deep conviction that sometime there was a land of innocence, a land without a flaw whose facts and fiction were interchangeable and whose causes were just in every case. There was murder at Flodden, and dear dead flowers who fell. There was dust that covered those at Culloden, left their blood to soak in the black peat moor. There was a prince whose highland heart followed his mind to thoughts of London, and a poor peasant who became a preacher and then swallowed half of the seeds of Scotland's future. There was a tenant farmer who made a brilliant melody, and a fearless advocate who died so that the cause of the people should ultimately prevail. All been done. It all has happened. All of it is in the past. But not necessarily so. There came from Pollock Shores a potter's son, who frankly told old Scotland where to go. And if we heed the deeds of John Maclean, Scotland will not be the same again. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>
at the time of the revolt for the short of working week um, in, in the period of Maclean. We've also got uh, things like Class Malcree, 1968, Lost Opportunity for Socialism in Ireland, which is a subject dear to uh, Maclean's heart, of course, at the time. We've got uh, one to mark the centenary of Lennon's death, 1917, Walls Come Tumbling Down, which is what I wrote in terms of trying to describe and analyse and celebrate the Russian Revolution, but also the rise of Stalinism. And we've got the transcript of the first lecture of this nature, uh, Socialism Returns in the 21st Century, literally what was said in their written form. So I'd appeal to you to consider that. And the last one is Break the Chains, which is my big book, uh, was no longer in print after three print runs are sold out. My principles are not sold out, but the book is. Um, <laughs> you can get it now for a cheaper rate, five quid, as a Kindle book. I mean, Kindle because there's no alternatives, any uh, real coverage. But uh, you get that on the, on the website that you'll see at the back. So I'd appeal to you to consider getting some, even all, of those. The price is at the back. They're all pretty modest. Uh, most of them are two quid, some are five. Okay. Now, finally, I appeal to you to consider something else. We're celebrating John McLean here. I think we can be proud of the celebration we've had in the form of uh, Henry's outstanding and comprehensive and fascinating uh, lecture. We're celebrating the life and struggles of our dear comrade and friend, Jim McVicker, as well. But we're not, as uh, Henry finished towards the end there, just looking back. We're looking forward. And when we look forward, there's a fork in the road, and the fork is down the road of uh, potentially nuclear destruction, certainly climatic uh, uh, destruction of the environment, of species, including the human uh, race. So we have that as one scenario painted by the powers of capitalism, and I don't think it's to exaggerate to put it that bluntly. And on the other hand, we've got the technology, as they said in other television programs, we have the technology, we have the, the artificial intelligence, we have the potential, we've got the human intelligence, we've got the skills, we've got the potential for things like a far shorter working week, for uh, a guaranteed decent level of minimum wage and beyond, for provision of universal basic services of a high standard instead of being a, in a state of disintegration as they are today in this country and many others. We have the potential, in other words, for human solidarity and human collective organisation being the source of undreamt of uh, wealth, both material and spiritual, if you want to put that way. I'm not religious, but in the other sense that <coughs> uh, We have those two choices, that fork of the road. And let me put it bluntly, one of the things that McLean was particularly uh, irritated by were those who on the left argued that socialism was inevitable. No, it's not. It has to be fought for. And he, for example, said, the safety of society rests not in the hands of a few leaders and heroes, but in those of the masses of mankind, conscious or unconscious. The moment will come when the workers will challenge capitalism to the last fight and win through to the world of society of a united human race producing each for all and all for each. That's the vision the Scottish Socialist Party has. And I would actually argue, without being in any way pompous or exclusivist about it, that the Scottish Socialist Party and our fighting programme for socialism, a phrase that uh, McLean also used in terms of his own election programme, for example, a fighting programme on the minimum wage, on the shorter week, on public ownership and investment, etc. All those different things, I think we best match the traditions, the aspirations, the ideals of John McLean. McLean is not for us an icon who was always right. I think there's things he was wrong on. Let me put as brief as that without getting stumbling into an example. I think there's things he was wrong on, but in fundamentals he stood on the side of the working class who produced the wealth in society and for a liberation of that class as a means of liberating humankind as a whole in a socialist future. A society of united human beings producing each for all and all for each. And uh, to quote 
one of his uh, friends and comrades, James Connolly, some of you heard me say many a time this, the only true prophets are those who carve out the future that they announce. You won't get socialism by waiting for it. <coughs> you won't get socialism by just thinking it's a good idea, a personal preference. You'll only get socialism by convincing the mass of the population in this modern uh, age, the working class of society, of the benefits, advantages and routes towards that socialist future. The working class is the class that will liberate humanity from all the prospects of that other choice of destruction, annihilation, extinction of species, including uh, humanity on the, on the planet. So join the struggle for socialism, join the organised collective form of socialist struggle in the case of Scotland in the form of the Scottish Socialist Party. Don't go for second best and say, I'll be a socialist in a non-socialist party. That has been tried and utterly failed. Join a party that's unashamedly socialist, be part of that, help to shape it and help to shape the future. Be one of those prophets, to use a phrase, who uh, creates and carves out the future that they announce. Join the SSP, but even if you don't, you're very welcome here. Enjoy yourself and come back in 15 minutes for the music. Thanks very much.